So tonight, we'll be talking about flesh and spirit, flesh and spirit. Now, again, theological studies outline is found in our website. So go to www.bbcenglish.org, and then in that website, just type down Theological Studies Outline, and then it'll consist the, the outline of all the teachings that we're going to be covering in discipleship. So the outline is for you to look at. Now, for these particular outlines where I teach each class, each subject that I cover, it's not online. It's only for people who attend our church. But for those of you who are watching us online, I write, that's why I write it out on a board so you can write it out. If you're watching live streaming, then you're going to have to wait for the archive video to come out. That way you can write the notes properly. Okay, so let's start off with the flesh and the spirit. This is the perfect introduction is Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 25. For time's sake, I will not read it, but you'll notice right there it gives a contrast between flesh and spirit. Obviously, flesh is not the good guy. The Holy Spirit is the good guy. And there's always a conflict, a contradiction within man. So it's a very interesting contradiction. The more that you understand this, these two natures, the more that you'll find power, strength, and grace and answers in your life. So before we cover more details concerning the flesh and spirit, let's cover the names. So let's cover the names of the flesh and spirit. So we know the terms, but the thing is, is that how do we know that these terms are right? So we're going to, Colossians chapter 3, verses 8 through 10, we won't turn there, but in this passage right here, you'll notice that the flesh is referred to as the old man, the old man. And then the spirit is referred to as the new man, new man. So you've heard these terms before. The old man is dead. You're looking at a new man because the old man is dead. But where did that term come from? Why, it's in your Bible. New man is referring to your spiritual nature. Old man is referring to your fleshy nature. Another passage is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 through 47. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 through 47, we see that the term Adam is referring to the flesh. And then we see the term Jesus, or otherwise known as the last Adam. The last Adam. He is referred to as the spirit. So keep an eye out whenever you see the contrast between Adam and Jesus, or last Adam. Whenever you see those terms in the Bible, Keep an eye out that maybe it will be referring to the fleshy nature versus the spiritual nature. And then you could probably find more golden nuggets as you do your own Bible study. Romans chapter 7, verse 14. Another name for the flesh is called carnal. Carnal. So the flesh is known to be called carnal, whereas the spiritual nature, which is pretty obvious, is referred to as spiritual, spiritual. The next name is found at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 46. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 46. When you look at that passage, the, the flesh is referred to as the natural man, natural. It's the spiritual nature, which is pretty obvious, spiritual. Another name for the fleshy nature, um, actually, I forgot to mention this one, which is important. So you want to turn to these passages. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. And then compare that with 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. If you'll turn over there, please. 2 Peter 2, 12 and 1 Corinthians 2, 14. Please turn to those passages. Now, what you're going to notice in those passages is that the natural man is not a reference to the saved Christian. Remember that. The natural man is never a reference to the spiritual Christian. It is a reference to the lost person in the flesh. If you're going to see a, uh, a saved Christian, 
yielding to the flesh, he's not going to be known as natural. He's going to be known as carnal here. See, carnal. So that would be in reference to a saved Christian. And that would be found at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And then 2 Peter 2.12. Let's compare those two passages right there and then see the case. Notice that the Bible says, but these as natural brute beasts. See that word natural? But look at this. This is, this is referring to lost people made to be taken and destroyed. Notice, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. That looks like lost people. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Notice that the lost person does not have the Holy Spirit in him, so he is not saved. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now compare that with chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. Notice that a natural man would refer to loss, but carnal is a saved person. Verse 1, and I, brethren, see that? Saved Christians. Could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto what? Carnal. Look at this, even as unto babes in Christ. These are saved Christians. You'll notice that. 2 and 3. Notice verse 3 calls them carnal again. Another term for the flesh is outward man. The outward man. That would be found at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 16, which we will not turn to. It is known as the outward man. And then you can guess what the spiritual nature is called, the inward man, inward man. So the spiritual nature will be known as the inward man. Another name for the flesh is nature, nature. So Keep an eye out for that term in the Bible when it says nature. It might be referring to the fleshy nature. But then you'll notice that when it mentions nature, it will go synonymously with the children of wrath. Children of wrath. So you can guess that this is referring to lost people when it says children of wrath. Whereas the spiritual nature... It's going to be found at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. It is known as the divine nature. Divine nature. So when it says nature, it's just an ordinary natural. See, natural, remember, is fleshy. So this is going to be fleshy. But when it puts divine here, then there's something different, and it's going to refer to the spiritual nature. All right, we're going to cover origin of flesh and spirit. So this is going to get a little bit interesting. We're going to go through a little bit of history here. We're going to go through a little bit of history here about the origin of flesh and spirit. Okay, what is the origin of flesh and spirit? Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Let's start it over here. Genesis chapter 2, and then we'll read verse 7. Let's begin over here about how the origin of flesh and spirit began. Look at Genesis chapter 2, and then we'll read verse 7. Notice that the Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Notice right here that it says the Lord formed breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So there's your spirit. Now you might say, really? Yeah, because what you got to understand is spirit comes from the Greek word pneuma. And then because it comes from pneuma, it actually means breath. By the way, you can just even look up the English word spirit, and then it's going to match with the word breath. So that's how the spiritual nature started. It began... At Genesis 2, verse 7, when God breathed into Adam. Now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. Notice that Adam, he truly did have a spirit in him. But it's a dead spirit. You can guess why. Because he sinned at the Garden of Eden. When he sinned at the Garden of Eden... His spirit died. 
Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and then we will read verse 45. So Adam did have a spirit, but it's dead. That's why you see a lot of lost people today who have a spirit in them, but it's a dead spirit. If you're not saved in Jesus Christ, you have a dead spirit. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So what you're going to notice right here, that 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45, it says, so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. So he's a living soul. But look at the contrast. The last Adam, ah, remember, who is the last Adam? What's that term? That's why it's important to remember these terms. Who is known as the last Adam? The spiritual nature, right? That's referring to Jesus, right? We covered that. Okay, if this is referring to the spiritual nature, Jesus, notice the last Adam was made a what? Quickening spirit. So a lively spirit. So there's a contrast with the lively spirit here with Jesus con contrasted with Adam. That means Adam had a dead spirit. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, please. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. That's why liberal professors who teach at Berkeley and they have several PhDs and they know Greek and Hebrew and they think they know so much Bible, they actually say one of the dumbest statements. They say that, well, God told them that when they ate the fruit, they would die, but they didn't die. Well, what a moron. Amen. What a moron. This is basic. I'm teaching you basic doctrines. The basic doctrine is their spirit died. We, looked, we compared that, the verse at 1 Corinthians 15.45. Apparently, I guess those guys, they don't know much Bible, despite of knowing so much other topics. Hmm. So notice that in these two passages, which we won't turn to, Genesis 2.17 and chapter 3, verse 4, that when they ate the forbidden fruit, their spirits died. So, Satan lied to them. If we eat the fruit, then we're going to die. And then you're going to notice in these two passages that, yes, their spirits did die. So Satan lied to them, where he said that you won't die. 1 Corinthians, turn over here, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. Turn over to this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. And then we're going to compare that with Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans 5, 12. Notice that because they ate the fruit, their spirits died. And then what happened is that death passed because of Adam. So we got to understand this. It's not just a physical death. It's a spiritual death that infected all of mankind. So when you are born from Adam, when you are given birth and made into existence in this world, you're born into this world, you are born with a dead spirit because that death was inherited and passed from Adam to the rest of his generations. So 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, notice that it starts off reading right here how death was inherited. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now Romans 5, 12 Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. See that? Because they sinned, that's why death was inherited. And so death passed upon all men. Why? Because everyone sinned. So because of sin, all, of, all the spirits were dead. Psalms chapter 51, verse 5. Turn to Psalms chapter 51, verse 5. Psalm 51, verse 5. And then your second hand, turn to Romans chapter 7, verse 9. Now, everyone is born with a sin nature. But what happens is this. Even though this death was inherited, right? We're born with it. Then does that mean if a baby dies, that the baby goes to hell? Because the baby has a dead spirit. What you got to understand is this. Even if you're born, what happens is that Born, but God doesn't count it dead. God doesn't count it dead until what? Until you know what is right and wrong. So that's why babies can go to heaven after they die. 
until they have knowledge of what is right and wrong, then the Lord, until they have such knowledge, then the Lord is going to count their spirits dead. So look at Psalms chapter 51, verse 5. Notice that we're all born in sin. So it does, there's no such thing as holiness. Everyone is born in sin. But God, because he's an understanding God, since babies, they don't have the knowledge yet of what is right and wrong, the Lord, he lets it go. Psalms 51, verse 5, the verse reads, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now compare that, Romans 7, 9. Notice that the verse says right here, from the Apostle Paul, for I was alive without the law once. So without the law, knowing the law. Uh, but when the commandment came, see, once I knew the commandment, sin revived, and I what? Died. See, God counted it dead. So now you're counted dead. But before then, you are considered counted alive. Even though you inherited death, God counts it. See, God looks at it. He counts it not as dead. Because you can't blame the baby. The baby doesn't know what is right and wrong. All right, now we're not going to turn to these passages, but when you look at these passages, so what's the uh, origin? We see the origins. Now, what's going on at the Old Testament then? Because they didn't have the Holy Spirit like we did, right? That's why the Holy Spirit came and go, uh, comes and goes. He comes and he goes. It depends on your righteousness, how you live for him. If you look at these three passages, which we won't turn to for time's sake, you're going to notice that the Holy Spirit can leave you. The Holy Spirit comes and goes. It depends on, remember, your spirit is alive when you know what is right. See, when you inherit what's wrong, then the spirit is considered dead. But so that's why, unless you stay righteous, then the Holy Spirit can remain. But if you sin then the Holy Spirit leaves. That's why it, it makes perfect sense that there is a difference of salvation in the Old Testament compared with the New Testament. John chapter 3, verse 3 through 7, now shows us something different about the operation of the Holy Spirit. Look at John chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. Notice now there's a difference of operation with the Holy Spirit once Jesus enters in the New Testament. He tells about two births, two births. Remember, when you have one birth or the first birth, what happened to your spirit? It's dead. So Jesus realized that I'm going to have to create a second birth here. And that second birth, we obviously know, we can guess. It's going to have to be spiritual because our first birth is not good. It created within us a dead spirit. Let's look at John chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time in his mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus does understand what he means by the second birth. But you'll notice, verse 5, he explains, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water. That's right, we were all born out of water. Uh, the pregnant lady her water broke right but look at the second one and of the spirit ah there's your answer that's the second birth verse 6 that which is born of the flesh is flesh first birth that which is born of the spirit is spirit ah there's your second birth marvel not that I send to thee you must be born again that's why Jesus said don't be surprised I have to tell you that there is a second birth look at John chapter 16 verse 13 John chapter 16 verse 13 Notice that Jesus Christ predicted to them that the Holy Spirit, that he will be coming down in the future. So Jesus Christ, he was preaching to Nicodemus about two births, that it was necessary. But remember, the Holy Spirit could not stay there. If, if people believe that, people in the Old Testament had the same Holy Spirit like we did, and they're anti-dispensational, that's just nonsense. And why would Jesus say that the Holy Spirit would come down in the future to his disciples? So it shows that throughout the Old Testament they had a different operation. Because why? Adam, Adam, Adam. But remember, who's known as the last Adam? Jesus. He's made a quickening spirit. 
So he made the change. He made the difference. That's why it's required that New Testament salvation after Jesus did the operation is very different. So number set, uh, not number seven, number eight, John chapter 16 and verse 13. Notice right here that it's in future tense. Can somebody read that passage for me while I write this down? Can somebody read that for us? Notice that the Holy Ghost is predicted to come in the future. Anyone? Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So notice right here, it is predicted to come down in the future. So now let's see what happens. Look at Titus chapter 3, verse 5, and then you'll compare that with 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Titus 3, 5, and then you're going to compare that with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. Notice that in these two passages that the Bible shows that the dead spirit became alive for Christians. Because remember, Jesus prophesied that the Holy Spirit would come down in the future. So finally, throughout the past millennia, where people had a dead spirit, the Lord finally revived the spiritual nature and offered it to mankind. Now look at Titus chapter 3. We're going to start with Titus, and then 3 verse 5. It says, not by works of righteousness which we have done. Ah, that's very different from the Old Testament. It didn't depend upon their righteous works where the Holy Spirit remains. But according to His mercy, He saved us. It's by Jesus. Look at this, by the washing of regeneration and what? Renewing of the Holy Ghost. See, their spiritual nature got renewed, revived, born again. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And that depends on faith this time. It does not depend on works. There's a, that is definite proof there's a distinction of salvations. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, Jesus, was made a what? Quickening spirit, alive. All right, look at Romans chapter, well, actually, we won't turn to these passages, but what you're going to notice is that Romans chapter 8, verse 10, as well as chapter 6, verse 2, 6 through 8, as well as Galatians 2, 20, as well as Colossians 3, 3, what you're going to notice in all of those verses that your body is now considered to be dead or crucified in sins. Back then, it was your spirit that was dead, right? Back then, when you were born in sin. But then what happens now is that your body, it's it reversed now. The body became dead when you got saved. That's what happens with salvation. Now it crucifies the dead. The old man, the fleshy nature, now the, re the roles reversed. You see how in the Old Testament, it, that's why a lot of it depended on flesh, flesh, flesh. That's why the Bible, it even have sanitation laws at Leviticus. Flesh, observance of days, flesh, sacrifices, flesh. They ha uh, their flesh had to do works. See, flesh, flesh. So notice that the operation, which was fleshy, now reversed into spiritual, because now it's going under Jesus Christ. So the body became dead or crucified in sins. Now look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. Now notice what happens in our case. So then, if our salvation is not dependent upon the works of our flesh, then let's use our heads a little bit right here. Then that means the Holy Spirit cannot come and go, right? Correct. Okay, then does that mean the Holy Spirit will never leave you no matter what you do in your flesh? Absolutely, because it does not depend upon your flesh. You see why this doctrine, this is a basic foundational doctrine that answers all sorts of doctrines and heresies out there. That's why it makes sense that no matter what you do in your flesh, you're still saved. The Holy Spirit can't leave you. 
That's why it makes sense that the Holy Spirit is sealed with you up to the rapture. That's the reason why God considers you holy and pure despite of whatever your flesh does. That's why salvation is by faith, because it's all by the work of the Spirit. It's not dependent upon what our body does, our flesh does in its works. See, it makes perfect sense. This foundational doctrine will open up a floodgates of a lot of things where you can grow in. Where you can grow in. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Holy Spirit sealed upon you till the rapture. Now, these two verses should be marked down or even memorized because they will be very helpful when you come across people who try to claim that you can lose the Holy Spirit, you can lose your salvation. Ephesians 1.13, in whom he also trusted. After that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that he believed. Did you believe? All right, after you believed, what happened? Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now compare that to Ephesians chapter uh, 4, verse 30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto when? The day of redemption. There's your rapture right there. The day of redemption is also called the rapture. Uh, I covered that in my other basic doctrine uh, study, so I'm not going to try to prove to you day of redemption equals rapture. I already covered that in my other discipleship videos. But aside from all that, we see right here the Holy Spirit sealed within you all the way to the rapture, no matter how many times you grieve the Holy Spirit with your sin. And Ephesians 1.13 says the condition is not based on work, but just by believing. You saw that, Ephesians 1.13. Combine these two verses, you got a powerful arsenal, and then you can use this to debunk any heresy out there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. Please turn over there, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. And then we're going to be comparing that with Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. And then we're going to be comparing that with Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. And then it's going to go backwards to verse 11. So we're going to look at these three passages right here. Now what happens is, when the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Ghost baptizes you, what happens to you is that your body becomes dead. Remember, that matches with everything we looked at. Your body becomes dead. And then what happens consequently is that your spirit becomes alive. Then Colossians 2.11, it's going to show you how this process works. So this verse is going to show you more accurately on how this process works. So let's cover all this. So you hear all these doctrines about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and you hear about the sealing of the Spirit, circumcision of Christ, and your body becoming dead into sin. You hear all these terms, but how does it work, folks? How does that work? Do you think that people are just throwing in those terms because it just sounds nice or it's religious? Or there's a meaning going on here? There's a meaning. Okay, so let's knock this off one by one. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. So notice that we're all baptized by the Holy Spirit. Now compare that with Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 5. It's very funny, people, Church of Christ, Campbellites, and different heretics, are going to use this passage to prove you have to get water baptized for salvation. That is not true. What you're going to find out, this is all referring to a spiritual baptism, the Holy Ghost baptizing you. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Knowing not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Now look at this. It's baptized into what? Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says when you're baptized, you become what? The body of Christ. See, so Romans 6, chapter 6, verse 3 through 5, is talking, not talking about water baptism, but the Holy Ghost baptizing you. Okay, now let's keep reading right here. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into what? 
death this matches with everything we looked at the body becomes dead when the spirit becomes alive how can water baptism make your body dead no it just makes your body wet that's it it doesn't make you dead if the body became dead after water baptism the church of christ pastor would be sued okay let's keep reading right here that like as christ that like as christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the father even so we also should walk in what newness of life see the newness alive remember the spiritual nature is also called the new man see everything is connecting here everything is making sense let's also look at for verse 5 for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death see something in us died we all we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection something in us became alive now let's review what part of you died and what part of you became alive? The spirit became alive, right? What part of you became dead? The body. That's why all of these verses are now making sense. It's not just throwing out religious ideas here just because it sounds spiritual or nice. No, there's a meaning behind here when you look at all the other verses previously. Let's also look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Now, spiritual circumcision is going to explain this process very, very clearly. Believe it or not, there's a lot of independent fundamental Baptist churches who do not believe in the doctrine of spiritual circumcision. Spiritual circumcision is an important doctrine. What that means is that when God circumcised you, what bodily part did he circumcise you? Because that's what circumcision means. Well, what bodily part? It's your whole body. So your spiritual nature was cut off from your physical fleshy body. That's the reason why that your fleshy nature is like an out, dead outer shell to you. That's why it makes sense that the fleshy nature is dead. Whereas the real you, the real you that's really alive, really thinking, the real part of you that makes you animated and alive is your spiritual nature. That's why it makes sense the Bible calls the spirit alive. See how everything's connecting? So spiritual circumcision explains the process. And notice it connects with baptism. Remember, Holy Spirit baptized you. Through these processes, it created it. Look at this verse. Colossians 2, verse 12. Buried with him in baptism. That matches with Romans 6. We are buried in baptism. And that's referring to the spiritual baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him through, the, through what? Faith of the operation of God. So notice right here that this baptism is done through faith. It's not done through works. And thus it shows that water baptism cannot be part of this process. Why? Because faith is the process here. So water baptism has nothing to do with it. Through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. There's an operation God is doing. What is that? Look behind verse 11. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. See? So what God circumcised you is your entire body of sins. That was separated from your spiritual nature. Now we're also going to turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. That's why it makes sense right here why water baptism is a great picture of that. Okay, so I'm writing a whole bunch right here in blue, so it's about time I kind of change colors here. So this is kind of long. So the origin of flesh and spirit, you notice, is extremely interesting. From the beginning of Adam, through the Old Testament, as Jesus came into the world, through the church age, and how exactly, through the process of salvation, how it worked, and through the process of salvation, we thus understand the doctrines of spiritual resurrection, becoming alive, old man becoming dead, spiritual circumcision, Holy Spirit baptizing us. We are sealed to the day of redemption. See, all those doctrines are connected because of very strange yet interesting process. Two natures, flesh and spirit. It is a very fascinating study. I'm only giving you basic doctrines. If I actually went so much more into it, it would be an intense and interesting study, perhaps.
But I would encourage people, since now you understand the foundations here of flesh and spirit, that you do some homework now and see how these two operate. I bet you you're going to find a way more things, way more things. Okay, now let's talk about the representations of the flesh and of the spirit. So how they are represented throughout the Bible is by several things. The first one is water baptism. Water baptism. So why do we practice water baptism? Because it's a great picture of your flesh being dead and your spiritual nature becoming alive. It's a great picture of that. So that's why it's a representation. First Peter, sorry, First Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Notice it says, the like figure. Is that what it said? That's right. So notice right here, this is a picture. It's symbolic. Something's picturing here. The like figure, even baptism doth also now save us. So water baptism here is a picture of what? Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. So it has nothing to do with cleaning up your sins. It has nothing to do with your salvation. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now notice that if you get rid of the parentheses, it shows baptism doth also now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you'll see right here that baptism, it can show here that it is a what? The first part, the like figure. It's a picture of what? The second part. Now save us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That Holy Spirit, spiritual baptism. Remember all those verses right here? Resurrection, Holy Spirit baptized us. It all matches. This is a spiritual baptism right here. And then the parentheses is even better. The parentheses show it has nothing to do with your salvation of cleaning up your sins. So this passage gets rid of water baptism for salvation twofold. It shows that it has to do with the spiritual baptism as well as it shows it has nothing to do with cleaning up your sins but actually just an answer of a good conscience. So this is a favorite passage used by Church of Christ, Campbellite, a.k.a. Water Dogs, Caleb Robertson, whatever, the, these knuckleheads, where they like to say that water baptism is part of your salvation. But because he's still young and he's on a, he doesn't know much Bible, he needs to read through the Bible several more times, and he's going to understand that there's a twofold application right here. Okay, so we'll see right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22. So watch out for these water dogs. These water dogs, they, it's amazing. Do you know what their doctrine is in debating? It's water, water, water. Can you imagine your whole life defending water? What a, what a life. I'm doing apologetics on water. <laughs> what a joke, man. What a joke. So the second representation of flesh and spirit is two atoms, two atoms. They also represent the dead, the flesh becoming dead, as well as the spiritual nature becoming alive. So compare that with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22, and verse 45. Notice how Paul the Apostle mentions here, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And then notice in verse 45, which we read uh, three times already. So we see a representation. This one we won't turn to for time's sake, but believe it or not, it's your testimony. Believe it or not, your testimony is a representation of your flesh becoming dead and then your spiritual nature becoming alive. So how's your testimony, folks, huh? Are you showing a good representation that your flesh is dead and that your spiritual nature is alive by your testimony? Or you're not showing a good testimony of that? Sometimes people can't tell the difference with you and a lost person. Hmm. Why? Because your, your representation is poor. Your representation is poor. Let's talk about the conflict of flesh and spirit. The conflict of flesh and spirit. So there's a lot of things to cover here. So let me go through this real briefly as fast as I can. So there's a conflict between flesh and the spirit. And it will go with like this till the day you die. Everyone hates this. Everyone hates this. This is your worst 
thing in your entire life. I don't care what you go through in your entire life. This is the worst thing in your entire life is the conflict between flesh and spirit for any person out there. So the conflict of flesh and spirit, how did this operate from beginning to the end? Well, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, we see that God's Holy Spirit cannot put up with the flesh of man. God's Spirit strove with man. It was in conflict. It was in conflict against human nature. That's why he drowned them out at Genesis chapter 6. We see that conflict ever since the beginning. And that's why the Holy Spirit, he can be grieved with our sin at Ephesians 4.30. That's why it says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Why does it say that? Because the flesh is conflicting. The flesh is conflicting with the Spirit. And then you'll notice that 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that's why it's warning you here that you better take good care of your flesh. You might say, why is that, Pastor? Well, I'll tell you why. Because God drowned the whole world. See, that flesh of man, his spirit strove, so he killed them. So, don't, so here's good advice. Be careful what you do with your body. And that's why this flesh, we live in a day and age where everything pleases the flesh. Technology, sex, sex, and sex in every screen, advertisement, billboards that little kids can't even escape it, that PG is not really PG anymore. So this is just becoming really, really bad. And then men and women dressing the way that they ought to dress. So you got to realize this. This is becoming really bad, and you better watch the attitude. You think that I'm strict about proper dressing in church? No, there's a reason here, folks. There's a reason. God hates that. It strives with the spiritual nature that he kills you. So take care of your body. Why? Because you're going to die. That's what the verse says. It says that if any man defile the temple of God, which is your body, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So take care of your body or else what? Die. You know what? People live in a day and age. Oh, it's not that bad. See, that's what sin does to you. You always say, oh, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Why do you have to make a big deal? You're ultra legalistic. See, he, they want, if you think like this, no, if I do that behavior or I dress this way or I look at that thing or I do something that grieves God, I'm going to die. Say this is death. You have to have that kind of paranoid mindset. Oh, that's mentally ill. Call me mentally ill, whatever, man. It's, uh, I don't want to gamble with God. That's playing with death. You want to play with death? Another thing right here is that Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, as well as Romans chapter 8, verse 13. It shows in those passages... Uh, where am I at? Oh yeah, flesh brings death, but the spirit brings life. So the flesh obviously brings death, so we covered that. And then the spirit, it brings life, which we covered. So it is very important to live according to the spirit so your life can increase. That's why you should look for spiritual things, not worldly things. If you keep looking at the world, the world, the world, the world, what are you looking at? You're just looking at death. That's what it is. Second, uh, in these passages, I just got so many verses here. I don't have time, so I don't have time to write. So uh, people online, you can, when you have the archive video, when the archive video is uploaded, just write these verses down and rewind them. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Uh, no, excuse me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11, chapter 3, verse 1, as well as 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, while your flesh is growing, your spirit is a baby because of that conflict. That's why it's important that as a Bible-believing Christian, you focus on spiritual things. If not, the spirit will remain a baby and the flesh will grow. And that conflict is really bad. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 and verse 14, the Bible says your spirit needs to grow up to a man. It needs to grow up to a man. Your spiritual nature right now is very small. It's a baby. So you got to read the Bible, you got to pray, you got to get that thing to grow. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1. This is a very good verse because it says be careful because the more sins you commit in the flesh, it will corrupt your spirit too. That is very important. So then 
because you got to understand this, not every sin is outward. It can also be inward. A lot of things are inward. Pride, arrogance, uh, selfishness, etc., etc. You got to watch your spiritual side too. Now, to avoid the confusion, this is not in reference to the Holy Ghost. Your saved spiritual nature in you, the Holy Ghost. It's actually referring to the spirit of man, which is found at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. It's referring to the spirit of man. Now, in Romans chapter 9, verse 1, as well as Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, the Holy Spirit, what he does is that he warns you in your conscience. Now, this is very important to understand. The Holy Spirit warns you in your conscience. What happens if you ignore the warning in your conscience? Then according to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 2, the conscience becomes seared. Why? Because you're not listening to the Holy Spirit anymore. You're listening to the evil spirits, the evil spirits, rather than the Holy Ghost. Did the, is it working? Oh, okay then. I thought the camera got full. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. It shows right here that when you keep listening to evil spirits, then what happens? Your flesh can eventually become possessed by Satan. Why? Because you've been yielding to the evil spirits rather than the Holy Spirit. So that conflict of flesh and spirit can be so bad where you're yielding so much to the flesh, now you're hearkening to devils. And you're hearkening so much to devils, now it reaches to a point where Satan possesses you. And you'll see that in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26, taken captive by him at his will. That's why it's important that Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, and James chapter 4, verse 7, the Bible warns you to keep resisting the devil. Why would it tell you to do that if Christians cannot be demon-possessed? The devil cannot get a hold of your flesh. It's important to resist. So you might say, how do, I avoid, how do I avoid the things of the flesh? Galatians 5, verse 16 through 26 is the standard passage on the things of the flesh compared with the things of the spirit. So all you have to do is just look at those categories and follow it. Colossians chapter 2, verse 5 shows that although you're separated in the flesh, we can still be together in the spirit. So we have a lot of our members who are not here with us tonight, but that doesn't mean they're with us in spirit. You'll notice sometimes people will do that to WhatsApp. I'm not there at church, but I'm there with you in spirit. Where do we get that idea from? That's from Colossians 2 verse 5. Why is that? Because remember, we're all joined into one spirit together, even though in flesh we're in different locations. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 5 through 6 shows that our spirit is currently together with Christ up in heaven right now. So that proves that you can't go to hell even if you wanted to. Your reservation is already made in heaven because your spirit's waiting over there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, verse 12, verse 21 through 22, as well as verses 25 through 27, the answer explains that because when the Holy Ghost baptized us, our spirits automatically became joined into one in the body of Christ. That's why it makes sense that a part of our spirit is up there and we're all joined in one spirit even though we're in different locations. One day the flesh and spirit will be reconciled together and it's going to be awesome. What's going to happen is according to Luke chapter 24 verse 39 as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Verse 44, verses 49 through 57. What's going to happen? These two things are going to combine. And it's going to be known as a spiritual body. What a body it will be. It's going to be a Superman body that's going to be phenomenal, a supernatural body. One day the Lord will unite these two things. That's why the resurrection, the rapture is required where the flesh is transformed and it will join together with our spirit up in heaven one day. Okay, so I hope that tonight's teaching has been a blessing to you. Okay, so then your next homework assignment. Let's see right here. I'm running out of options here. We've covered a lot. Of, I think we're going to finish this real f soon, folks, so that's awesome. Okay, we're going to be covering the serious. Uh, your homework assignment is to listen to, uh, let's see right here. Uh, seriousness of sin. 
seriousness of sin. That will be your homework assignment. Listen to that audio. The link will be posted underneath this video. Let's close with a word of prayer. God, my Father, I pray that tonight's teachings were a blessing to the hearers and that may we grow more in our spirit and avoid the wicked things of the flesh so that we can please you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.